Hello, and welcome everyone to Talks at Google. I'm Bradley Horowitz. I'm a VP of product and an advisor to Google. And it's my pleasure today to welcome Diego Perez to Google. Uh, Diego Perez is a meditator and a New York Times bestselling author who's widely known on Instagram and various social media channels through his pen name, Young Pueblo. Online, he has an audience of nearly 3 million people. His writing focuses on the power of self-healing, creating healthy relationships, and the wisdom that comes when we truly work on knowing ourselves. His books, Inward and Clarity and Connection, were both instant bestsellers. And his new third book, Lighter, Let Go of the Past, Connect with the Present, and Expand the Future, was just released. And I'm happy to say it's not only an instant bestseller, but it reached number one in its category on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, I also want to share that Diego is a friend and a colleague. Uh, we work together on an effort called Wisdom Ventures, which uh, we'll be excited to tell you about. So it's a special treat introducing him. Diego, welcome. Thank you for having me, Google and Bradley. Thanks so much for doing this with me. This is pretty exciting. And I really wish this was in a live setting with, you know, hundreds of, of uh, folks who know you and, and are about to get to know you. Uh, but uh, this is the new now. And um, <laughs> I think we both experienced it's extremely powerful and it, it works well, too. So uh, you're actually in the Bay Area um, and, you know, so close and yet so far. <laughs> um, so uh, Google is... Um, in my experience, and I've been at Google about 15 years, a, a really, really special place. And I think that uh, there's a lot of curiosity uh, amongst the employees at Google. And I imagine many of them have read your books and followed you on social media channels for many years. And there are probably others who came because a friend encouraged them and don't know much about your personal story or past. And so I think a great place to start, and, and I know this is a 13-hour story fully told because <laughs> I, I, I just consumed it myself. Um, I really enjoyed your book. Um, but can you give us maybe the, the five or six-minute version about your own personal story and what led you to be writing books and sharing wisdom on social media? Sure. So I was born in Ecuador in this city called Guayaquil. And um, when I was about four years old, my parents decided that uh, we should take the risk of building better lives in the United States. Um, so we moved to Boston. And um, when we were there, it was just my, you know, my mom, my dad, my brother and I. And as we were growing up, I saw that there was a tremendous struggle happening with my parents. Like they were... Um, very often trying to figure out how to pay rent, how to um, put food on the table. And this was like a constant thing, like year after year, uh, we were stuck in this this tremendous poverty trap. Um, my dad, he worked in a supermarket and my mom, she worked cleaning houses. So there was, there was you know, no real opportunity for upward mobility for us. Um, and it was like that for years, you know, it was like that for, I would say for about like, um, like until I was 17, 18, it was really hard. Um, and during that time, that sort of stress that I saw happening in my, between my parents, I think a lot of that was imprinted in me as well. And um, I developed these like tendencies towards sadness and anxiety that, um, you know, were sort of taking root in my mind. But as I got older, um, they slowly started uh, becoming deeper, stronger. And when I got to college, they started manifesting into these like pretty nasty habits where I was um, going out all the time, partying all the time, doing a bunch of different drugs all the time. And um, this like snowball effect, it really came to a breaking point when I was um, about 23 years old. It was a year after I graduated from college. And I almost lost my life one night because I just had consumed so many different drugs. Um, and my body was just like utterly exhausted. Like it literally couldn't handle anymore. It was, you know, so run down for this like continuous, like five year um, cycle of me just like doing my best to get away from myself. Like I was doing everything in my power to just avoid any of the tension that was happening inside of me. 
And that um, early morning when I was like struggling for my life, I was like literally on the floor um, feeling how my heart was going to explode. And in that moment, I realized that what got me there was me lying to myself, me just like not wanting to admit to myself that I didn't feel good, that something was really wrong. And when I finally accepted that on the floor, um, I knew that I didn't want to die this way. I didn't want to like have an, you know, just like flame out and just disappear. Um, so I knew that to pull myself out of that, I had to start telling myself the truth. So for about a year after that moment, um, I just really focused on building positive habits, on, um, you know, giving my body more nourishing food. I started going to the gym. I stopped doing really hard drugs. Um, and I, probably the most important thing I did was I started sitting with these really tough emotions. And this is before I even began meditating. Um, I just sort of challenged myself to just sit with any of the anxiety that was coming up without immediately going and like rolling a joint or like going and just doing something to get away from it and numb it down. Um, and that helped me a lot. And when I, after that year passed, it was the summer of 2012, I did my first, um, silent 10 day Vipassana course. And that really accelerated all of the healing. It really just, um, took it to a level where, um, healing felt even more real than before. And I could notice a significant difference in, um, my mind, like my mind literally felt lighter. Um, so as I kept doing more courses, I started seeing that these changes, like I, I wasn't lying to myself, you know, it was like, these changes were real. They were significant. Um, I can see them the people around me can see them as well. And um, this like spark of creativity started bubbling up that wasn't ever really there for me before. And um, that's what started inspiring me to just start sharing on Instagram because that at the time, that's where everybody was hanging out. And, um, and I started developing my voice as a writer and sort of fast forward to 2017, I put out my first book inward and, um, and then started, you know, being an author. Mm. Well, that's an amazing story, and um, the story is told in, in a lot more detail in the book, and, you know, it's one of those books where, I don't know if you've seen people with a highlighter, and the whole book is yellow, basically, yeah. you know, because uh, there's so much pithy content and quote-worthy. You do tell your own story with great honesty and vulnerability, but there's also just a lot of things that really rung true like a bell for me and I wanted to remember. Um, so the good news is you don't have to highlight it because you actually do a great job on your Instagram feed of like daily summarizing mm -hmm. some of these nuggets and sort of bringing them to us. But I wonder, your first two books were more poetry and yeah. this one is much more prose, expository, autobiographical what was it like for you opening up and sharing your own journey like that? Oh, it was really hard. I was super resistant. Um, I really liked, you know, I, I accidentally stumbled a, a, upon the name Young Pueblo and I started realizing that as things started, started growing, I enjoyed sitting in the like quiet shadows of this name. Mm -hmm. You know, Diego Perez would like sit behind Young Pueblo and I was like, oh, I love the anonymity. Like, I like um, just, you know, writing and telling people, like, um, you know, just sharing my reflections, basically. But then when it came time to put together this book, like, I knew that I wanted to have a book that just had everything that I thought was important about personal transformation and also building a bridge to connecting how personal transformation can help influence us in, in changing the world and helping it become much more compassionate. But... um when I started putting the book together, my editor was like, I, you know, we need to, we need to hear more of you. Like we need, <laughs> we need more of your story in here. And I realized that he was right because I needed to show where these reflections were even coming from. Like, why was there even a sort of um, this, this drive to share? And um, I think it was um, a pretty serious back and forth between me and my editor where he just like helped me, you know, just be more vulnerable. And, and I really thank him for that because it was, it was tough in the beginning. And then once I got going, um, the stories just started like flowing out and it was like, oh, I get this and I see the value in this. And, um, and it's totally fine for me to share some of these parts of my life.
Mm. And I imagine given the topic of the book, there's also confronting shame maybe that, Mm -hmm. you know, is associated Mm -hmm. with your past and um, confronting ego that might come up about why, why am I putting myself forward in, in this way? Yeah. So it seems like the book itself was in a way a practice and caused even more introspection and, and work to happen. Yeah. And it's, it's funny too, because um, when I think about all the people who've helped me, you know, different books that I've read, different, um, you know, I, I meditate in the SN Goenka tradition, but at, at each of these 10 day courses, there's always two teachers who are up there sitting on the Dhamma seat and thinking about all these different teachers who've like held that space for me when I've gone to retreats. Um, like all these people that I've come across who've, you know, stood up as leaders and have helped people take steps forward. Um, I'm grateful to those who have. And I, you know, sort of think to myself that I, I don't really see myself as a teacher. Like I see myself as a, an explorer, as a student. And I, you know, I share the reflections that I, that I come across. Um, but I'm also happy to serve in this way because at the same time, like there were so many people who served me with their writing that it's in a way, it's almost like paying it forward. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And do you think young Pueblo, now that you have sort of stepped forward and, you know, your face is known, um, not only talks at Google, but you're on Good Morning America and the Today Show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think you've sort of emerged as Diego. Mm-hmm. Um, is Young Pueblo still an important vehicle for you? Or do you think eventually you'll consider, um, you know, blogging without the pen name? Um, I've always thought about it as a project. Um, and projects have beginnings and ends. Um, so I think I'll release probably two more books under the name Young Pueblo. And then I'll have to check in with myself and see, like, Mm -hmm. do I want to write more? Do I want to do something else? Um, And, and if I do, should I use my own name? But um, I'll have to figure that out when the time comes. But I've always thought of it, like, even when I first, first began writing, I was like, you know, coming out of the activism world, like I was an organizer. And I was like, let me do this writing thing for a while. And then I'll see how long it lasts. And um, so I still kind of feel like that. Like, I don't, I don't want to write 80 books. I want to write like a few really good ones. Yeah. I found that part of the story about your activist organizing roots, you know, really interesting and not unrelated in a lot of ways. Activism is about affecting a change in the system or on the outside. And a lot of the journey you've been on is sort of taking the same, uh, passion and sort of reflecting it on the inside. So um, can you share a little bit about what you think were the lessons about um, uh, what you learned as an activist and an organizer and working with community and things like that? Yeah. um, I mean, those, you know, when I think about high school and that, that, that time period of my life, I think I got most of my education was coming from um, all the organizing that I was doing. And so I started organizing when I was about 15 years old with this amazing group called Boston Youth Organizing Project. And it was a, a group that was youth led, but adults supported. So adults would like teach us how to organize and teach us the fundamentals. And then young people would then teach other young people how to organize. And then once we knew how to, we would look at our city or at our schools and decide like, oh, what do we not like about these situations? Okay, now let's change them. Let's like Um, and not in like a service manner, but like in an organizing manner where it would be like, okay, like either, you know, who's our target? Like, is it the principal? Is it these city counselors? How can they give us what we want? Then we would launch a campaign to try to, you know, rally support and put pressure on our targets to give them, you know, the thing that we're asking for. And we made a lot of changes in the city. And I think one of the biggest lessons I got was that material change is totally possible. That if you just Mm -hmm. get like an organized group of people, even if it's like 30, 40, 50, 90 people, like you can make big changes in your city or in the country. So seeing that to me was like really inspiring that like impact was possible. And I think when, um, when I started meditating, I started realizing that that external change was always so great, but there was a lack of internal change that I needed to kind of balance things out. And um, 
learning about that like internal change and understanding that dynamic just helped me see that um, writing could also be this vehicle for change because to me, like the world just seems really um, immature. Like when I was examining myself, mm -hmm. I saw my own immaturity. And then when I started thinking about things globally, I was like, wait, we can't do fundamental basic things. Like we don't know how to clean up after ourselves. We don't know how to not hit each other. We don't know how to share well. We don't even know how to tell the truth. Like it's mm -hmm. just like these fundamental things that we're supposed to learn as four-year-olds. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we collectively don't have them down yet. So it felt um, fitting to write under the name Young Pueblo because it puts everything within this sort of space that's like, oh, um, you know, humanity is maturing because we're all young people in this mm. moment. And um, and I felt like connected to that for myself as an individual, but also globally, like we have a lot of growing up to do. Yeah, that's really a beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, as you reflect on your past, whether it's the poverty of your childhood or the heroic efforts of your parents to bring you to Boston mm -hmm. or um, your self-abuse with drugs. And mm -hmm. um, does it feel sort of like there was this moment, this pivotal moment where you, you sort of adopted radical self-honesty? Um, how do you relate to that past? Is it something like those things needed to happen to get you to that point? Or were there sort of lessons inherent in there, like the organizing effort or mm -hmm. other things that you learned growing up amongst those circumstances that are sort of applicable to the, the person you've become? It's interesting because I, I think about it two ways. Like for me personally, like I wouldn't change anything because it it, it really helped me become who I am now. But at the same time, like, you know, I like to be open about the fact that like when I was growing up in Boston, right, I went to a high school where if you were Latinx, you had a 50% chance of graduating. Um, and sorry, not a high school, a bus, like a, a public school system. So we're talking in the whole city of Boston, um, you had a 50% chance of graduating. So that means that people were just dropping like flies. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, my family, when we came to the United States, it was a great gamble, like a huge risk. You know, you're just really just throwing the dice and hoping for the best. And things lined up for us well, because as we got older, you know, like as I became a teenager, like I started working, my brother, when he became a teenager and an adult, he started working. So all of these sort of changes changed our family, our, our family economic situation. And, um, and as we got older, things continued to improve because we were able to, you know, share wealth collectively and just like support all of us lifting up. And but at the same time, though it worked for my family, I've seen a lot of families that it did not work for, like a lot of people that I grew up with who, you know, people who en either ended up in jail, ended up dead, or it just um, was a, a story of sorrow as opposed to a story of success. So yeah, it's, it's interesting looking back on it all. And it almost feels like two lives. It feels like, um, you know, the, who I was before I started meditating and who I was after it's like two very different people. Like I was really rough before I started meditating. Hmm. I will say the, the book really ends on a very positive note. I mean, both in terms of the kinds of change we can affect personally, but also optimistic for our collective future in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think the notion that, humanity itself is sort of an infant allows me to approach it with a lot more understanding and compassion and less judgment, you know, than, than I would uh, when I sort of look at the surface um, polarization. And um, so I, I think uh, it's a, it's a really great framework you present about the possibility for both inner and outer change and the connection and, and interdependence on, on those. Um, but I want to ask you a question related to technology. And, you know, sure. you have millions. You mentioned 30 people can affect a lot of good in the world and a lot of change in a city. Um, you've got many orders of magnitude more than that uh, following you daily now. Uh, millions, three million plus. Um, what, what can that community do? And how do you think about that community of people that you've uh, attracted and gathered and brought together and how they are 
their presence might make a better world for both themselves and, and the outside world too. It's interesting because I, I just started having um, live events. So like the internet side of things, it's very, um, it's hard for the human mind to really imagine those gigantic numbers. Like, um, you know, like what does like 2 million really look like to me? Like, I don't, I don't really know. You know, like in my, my mind, it doesn't really, it can't fully, like I can't honestly say that I can understand what that magnitude. Um, but when I have events and it's like, you know, 900 people come, it's really inspiring because all these people are like actively healing themselves, like actively doing one thing or another to turn that lens inward, do some self-examination either through therapy, through journaling through meditation whatever it is you know whatever is the thing that works for them well um and i i get really inspired by that because i know from what i've seen in my personal life and in the people around me who've taken their own healing seriously is that as you elevate your self-love um it it's real self-love if it opens a door to unconditional love for all beings and that unconditional love is not going to be perfect but it starts opening that door and as that self-love increases, you're just going to be far less interested in harming other people. And mm -hmm. to me, like, that's kind of what I think about. And that's why I talk a lot about self-love um, in all of my books, because I'm hoping to, like, put that energy out there where it's like, okay, um, you know, let's reflect on ourselves. Let's try to heal our past traumas. And actually, like, if we just do this, like, internal, personal, intimate work within ourselves, that's going to create a situation where there's just less people who want to hurt others intentionally mm -hmm. or unintentionally. We're going to just be a lot more mindful about how they move around the world and the systems that they support. Mm. And what about technology? We hear a lot of uh, critiques well-deserved of big tech mm -hmm. and addictive technology, social media. Um, how do you personally approach technology both as a personal consumer and a creator? What are yeah. your thoughts about this vehicle? I think it's interesting. I think it has a lot of similarities to um, the 1890s and 1900s with um, corporations that were first emerging and becoming these like huge monopolies. Um, I think at that time the government was a bit stronger and they, um, you know, started developing all these like antitrust laws and whatnot to kind of just like, try to tame the dragon of business. Um, we live in a time today where it's like, okay, now this evolution of business, it's so wrapped around this um, tech and the internet. It has a lot of massive positives. Like I think it's actually, you know, when we're talking about like BLM or the Me Too movement or just like being able to understand and have compassion for situations that are happening across the world, it has really pushed things forward um, and accelerated things. But on the other hand, we're also learning about the things that we're even creating and designing. So there are like these negative, you know, giant negatives, giant positives. So I think it's just a moment of evolution. And um, I'm quite interested to see how it's going to unfold because there is a need to like humanize things and to continue supporting human flourishing and human dignity and a lot of that revolves around how um, tech will affect the way our minds work you know so we need to create technology that doesn't increase our craving because craving just mm -hmm. creates suffering it's like simple like the buddha said this 2600 years ago like craving is the root of suffering and if if our tech is just enhancing craving 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 then we're going to be terribly miserable, but we're but very well connected. Um, and yeah, there are some texts that depend on that craving as a business model, you know, and promoting that craving. And it seems like a, a very vicious uh, cycle. That totally, we're in. totally. But yeah. that's what I'm excited about. Um, the work that we're doing with Wisdom Ventures is that I feel like what we set ourselves out to do is that not only are we going to try to fund um, companies that are going to just design their products in a manner where they keep the well-being of the user in mind we're going to fund them but we're also we have, we're trying to push forward this bigger idea that compassion itself is a good business that you can create in a manner where it's like 
okay, we want to give you a great product. We want to give you a product that you're going to want to use, but we're also, we're not going to try to do any shady things in the background or just like, just, you know, unintentionally or intentionally harm you in some manner and just keep you like plugged in 24 seven. So I think there's um, a middle road that we can find mm -hmm. where people can be connected in a healthier way. Yeah. And just cause the topic came up, I, I'll, say a little more about Wisdom Ventures. It's a small seed fund. Uh, Diego and I are partners in this, and we have four other amazing partners, each of which amazing in their own right, including Ruchika Sikri, who was uh, head of well-being at Google, former Googler who uh, all of us are enjoying the 15 years of work that she poured into Google to make it a better place for us. Uh, but uh, as Diego said, sort of an abiding faith that technology can be a force for good in the world. We've seen apps like Headspace and um, Calm and, you know, things that really are intending to be good for people's well-being and mental health. And so we're putting our heads together and, and putting a little capital toward the problem and trying to find things that are legitimately great for people, great for communities, and deserve a chance to manifest in this world. And it's been an incredible journey already. We've been doing this for, at least I've been doing this for maybe nine months helping out. Uh, but um, I think we're just getting started. So hopefully we'll have a big impact there. Um, I wanted to ask you, you use the word um, healing journey, and I think in the book you also refer to this as the healing generation. Mm -hmm. and I assume you mean um, the younger generation maybe, and I think it's a really nice thing, the healing generation, because it's both the generation that is being healed, and it's also the generation that is doing the healing, you know, the healing generation. Um, can you say more about healing journey? And maybe... Yeah. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Um, I like to use the term journey because it is. It's like you're going to sign up. For, you're signing up for an adventure. Like it's it's gonna it's gonna be serious. And um, and being able to just like understand your own emotional spectrum, understand your emotional history, and just be able to have that courage to face it all. Um, it's gonna. It takes years. It takes years of development and. Um, and you'll see progress from the beginning. You know, that's why people keep at it for years and years and years. And and in being able to embrace your growth like that, I think it's a it's a beautiful part of life. I think that's one of the reasons why we're alive is to grow. Um, but it feels especially like this moment in history that we're in, um, I think it's really unprecedented. Like I don't know of another time where like possibly during the time when the Buddha was alive, but even then it only reached so far, um, you know, the teaching itself. But now we live in a time when there are just so many modalities, like we're talking Eastern modalities, Western modalities, indigenous modalities. You can just go on and on and they're accessible all over the world and they become way more accessible than before. Like you can literally just go on YouTube and learn how to meditate. You don't even have to download an app. Mm -hmm. You can just like, like, people put their stuff out there. And I think there's still a ways to go in regards to accessibility, but we, it's, we have to like realize we've come a massive way. So I think it creates a situation where, you know, people can find that thing that meets them where they're at, that thing that is challenging, but not overwhelming, something that connects with their intuition and, you know, helps them navigate their own sort of internal forest and, I, I really do believe this like healing generation is arising. And I actually think it's everyone. I think it's everyone who's alive mm -hmm. today. I think if, um, if you're alive today, it's more, um, there's the opportunity for healing more than ever before. And, and I think it gets me, um, it, it gives me a lot of hope because I know the challenges that we have are daunting. Like the challenges that face humanity that during this century, they're big ones, but I don't think it's an accident that at the same time we have these massive challenges, we have this like incredible tool that's right in front of us, which is like our own healing facing us. And that's going to allow that creativity that we need to look at old problems and solve them in new ways. It's going to allow that to emerge. Fantastic. I, I wanted to mention that we have a few questions that have come in and we'll get to those questions in about 15 minutes. If you do have questions, please do submit them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, you talked about all of the modalities available and the modality that 
you have chosen to pursue with passion and determination and grit is meditation. And um, in some ways, it seems counterintuitive that meditation would be the kind of therapy that soothes the wounds of the past. And, you know, I think oftentimes when we think of processing that, we might think of um, therapy, you know, psychotherapy or mm -hmm. other sort of ways of intentionally sort of processing it. Um, how does it work in meditation that you sort of confront and address and heal from sort of these past conditionings? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of, uh, so med there are a lot of different styles of meditation um, and a lot of them have different goals, different things that they're trying to cultivate in the human mind and body. Um, but for many of them, and I think a lot of them that are rooted in um, the Buddhist teachings, um, they are, they're meant for deconditioning, like literally to decondition the mind. Um, so a lot of something that people don't often realize is that how they have felt in the past, how they've reacted to what they felt in the past, it gets accumulated in the mind. It gets accumulated in the subconscious. So let's say you're often reacting with anger over and over again, that's just going to make it easier for your mind to, to react with anger in the present or the future. Um, so as these things accumulate, they get hardened into these patterns. And when you start this process of meditation, um, it allows you to just become aware of these patterns and also to cultivate aspects of the mind that are counter to those patterns. So instead of you reacting blindly and immediately, you start cultivating patience, you start cultivating self-awareness, you start cultivating present moment awareness specifically. Mm -hmm. And that creates a situation where the mind becomes much more spacious and um, less controlled by the past. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of the healing that happens, um, you know, I think for like a lot of people think that healing is very sort of imaginative and you're like reimagining your traumas and, you know, and whatnot. But I think a lot of healing actually happens through the present moment and it happens with mm -hmm. how you choose to handle what you feel in the present moment because a lot of healing doesn't happen through thinking it happens through mm -hmm. feeling and when we change the way we relate to what we feel we actually start releasing that pressure that sort of is existing in our past mm. i was reminded something of something you wrote in lighter that really uh sent me thinking about things and it was about our authentic selves and i think a lot of times we feel like our first blush reaction that's the true me and then i sort of tamp that down and um you know don't don't sort of um allow the id or the sort of you know mm -hmm. unbridled self to manifest but um your framing was different that oftentimes what that first thing to arise is the, the reaction is the social conditioning and the sort mm -hmm. of accumulation, as you said, of, of impressions and responses and conditioning, and that it takes a beat and a moment to sort of not get, not to confuse that for the authentic self, because in the moment, it feels like it is because it's coming up so spontaneously and involuntarily. And um, that pause and that patience, as you said, sort of really get beyond the veil of those reactions to what's lying underneath is where the authentic self lives. And I, I just thought that was amazing and uh, incredibly well articulated in the book. So, so thank you for explaining that. And um, it, you know, a lot of times in the book, and I mean this as the highest praise, it will not sound that way, but almost everything in the book felt like something I already knew. Mm. And it, that's, and there's a difference between already knew and already do, you know, <laughs> sometimes you reframed it in a way that was very, very helpful, mm -hmm. but it had the ring of truth in it. It was sort of like, you didn't need to convince me, you needed to remind me of these mm -hmm. things and sort of make me more aware of these things. Um, but that sort of ring of truth is something I love when I read a book. And, um, one of my mentors and leaders at Google used to say repetition does not spoil the prayer. And so hearing these things sort of again and again is part of it. 
Um, another thing I thought was interesting is in your Dark Knight of the Soul, in the moment when you sort of um, hit rock bottom, you approached the transition with radical honesty. And we have a, a leader here at Google, a former Googler, who wrote a book called Radical Candor. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever come across that book, but it's really about how to approach other people with really uh, honesty as compassion. And mm -hmm. it may seem that sugarcoating or, you know, um, uh, deflecting or suppressing things is doing them a favor or a courtesy, but she really believes in um, the candor. Her name is Kim mm -hmm. Malone Scott and the book Radical Candor is incredible. And, and um, she's uh, a coach and a leader to many in the business community now. But I thought it was interesting that you said radical honesty, um, which is more sort of taking that same intention and flipping it around. Just with you. Work. Yeah. Yeah. And can you tell me why radical? What's, what's radical about being that honest? Yeah, I, I thought about it as radical because it was like a, like a breaking moment in my life. Like it, it felt like I was um, almost like a new like history, like a new sort of stage had opened up in my own life. And um, I think that's why I use the word radical because it just felt like a break. Like it was like we're breaking with the past right now. And um and I wanted to, you know, I let people know, like, that I think radical honesty, like, I don't, it's definitely not a term that I created. It's like, it's been floating around for a while. And, and it's, this is just my view on it. And, um, you know, it's definitely not about telling other people what you think or anything like that. It's really about you and yourself and mm -hmm. enhancing that connection between you and yourself. Um, and I just, I found it so valuable that even though it was hard to just, face what I didn't want to admit before. And um, I think there was a lot of um, a lot of growth that came from that. And I think in a lot of ways, it actually prepared me to be able to handle um, this like whole another level of radical honesty when you go and meditate for 10 days silently, because that's like taking your radical honesty to like a whole higher level because the mind becomes like a microscope and you can really clearly see yourself. Um, but um, I would I actually love to hear more about that, because I know you've not only done 10 day retreats in complete silence. Mm -hmm. um, what is what is the longest retreat you've done? Uh, 45 days of silence. Yeah. Can you share what that experience is like, the arc of going in that deep for that <laughs> long? Um, it's fantastic. It's like the it's always the the best party of the year um, for me. <laughs> um, I so, so I it's be, it's pure bliss and you're just no, uh, no, smile on your face for no it's it's hard work it's um it's definitely not about bliss it's the way we approach like um, all the sensations and the feelings in the body is just to observe them as a, a, another changing thing so it's all about deepening our understanding of impermanence um, and when we go to these retreats we sort of break up the retreat into the first third um, will focus on calming and concentrating the mind by being aware of our natural breath. It's a technique called Anapanasati. And, um, and then the last two thirds of the course, we practice Vipassana, which is basically being aware of the truth within the framework of the body. And um, when you're aware of that truth by literally feeling the body, the, one of the biggest things that becomes clear is a truth of impermanence that pervades the entire universe. Um, you know, everything that arises ultimately passes away and you literally feel that in the body. Um, so, you know, with those 45, the 45 day course, um, I meditated the Anapana for 15 days and, um, and it's fantastic because it, it really, you know, calms and concentrates the mind. But then for the next 30 days, the Vipassana work is like that hard deconditioning work where like, you know, you're meditating, you're feeling the body and then like, anxiety comes up and you, you know, observe it calmly, calmly and equanimously, and then like some other emotion comes up and you don't know what's going to come up and it'll be quiet for a few days. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, like this rush of whatever other emotions coming up. And it's literally just these old uh, facets of your conditioning burning up and burning away. And what you're doing, it's, it's almost like a, my wife describes it as a controlled fire. You know, you're like, mm. uh, 
you you are doing this technique and you are allowing this burning to happen in a controlled manner in a safe manner but it's hard and you know people consider solitary confinement cruel and unusual punishment you know to yeah. leave people with no distractions other than their own mind and body in mm -hmm. this situation without stimulation and i yeah. i i've heard you describe that that the situation is you know, you're not speaking, no one's speaking to you, you're not getting TV, media. No one's even looking at you. Everyone's looking down at the ground when we're walking around. Yeah, you're totally by and, yourself. And is it excruciatingly boring sometimes? Is that part of the experience? No, no, it's not boring. It's like, it's in, it's like the most, like if you love learning, then you'll love this. Like if you really love to learn, and when I did my first silent 10 day course, I honestly felt like I learned more in 10 days and four years of college. And when I go back, um, you know, and I go back once a year to do these longer courses, and then I'll go back a few other times to do shorter courses of 10 days. Um, when I, like, when I go back, like when I came out of the 45 day, I was just like in awe. Like I was like, I learned so much that it's going to take me a whole year to process this, to just like really slowly let it integrate. And, um, and not only is like the way my mind works different, like it's so much calmer than it used to be, but the way that I'm perceiving situations, the way that I'm perceiving the dynamics between me and my wife and my family members, like I'm more so allowing that truth of change to just help me show up in better ways. Mm. And I guess we should mention that uh, you don't start with a 45 day no. retreat, you sort of build your way up to that. Yeah. And so how does that relate to the person who might find 10 minutes to meditate in the morning or, uh, you know, start a daily practice that's a lot more modest? Is it, mm -hmm. is it the same thing you're tapping into or now after a 45 day retreat, does the daily practice become more deepened and poignant? Yeah, way, way deeper. Um, it's way, um, it's hard to describe, right? Because it's really personal. It's hard for me to like, Mm. totally give you my experience. I can't quite do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, but it does, it, it deepens a lot over time. And it, um, and it's funny, this, this one teacher that I really look up to, he talks about it as like, you know, for maybe like a, a few years, your practice feels like an uphill battle. And then there's like a point when you reach that you just take off and you just start, you mm. know, your, your level of efficiency when you're meditating of this, like burning away, of all this conditioning, um, it just becomes a much higher level of efficiency and, um, and you, you, the growth, it accelerates. And, um, I think it's like, it's unlike any other thing that I could do with my life. So I've really, I put a lot of time into it and, and, um, I've been really inspired specifically by Yuval Noah Harari <clears throat> because he, um, he's also, he meditates in the same tradition that I do and he's been at it longer cause he's, um, I think he's got like like 10, 10 or 15 years on me. But um, it's amazing seeing how <clears throat> like his writing, you know, he writes about history and economics and, and all these like uh, in politics, but he writes with this like clarity that oh, um, amazing. It's, and it's, it's such a sharp clarity. And he always says like, it's because I meditate. It's because, and he mm -hmm. goes away once a year to, to do either a 45 day course or a 60 day course. Um, and I, you know, totally understand where he's coming from. Cause it's like the clarity that I offer in my writing, it's directly related to my meditation practice. Like only because mm. of that, can I write? Uh, we're going to turn now to questions from our viewers. Um, and so while they pull that up, I have one question for you and this may fall in the realm of things that are too personal to answer. And maybe I'm, pushing the, the metaphor <laughs> too far. But when you talk about burning up past mm -hmm. conditioning in the fire of meditation, is that something you're doing through willful intention? Or is it something you're witnessing as a process? Um, That's like a great how question. much uh, rubbing two sticks together do you have <laughs> to do to get that fire going? Or is it more about getting out of the way and allowing it to happen? Yeah, it's the second. So what you're really trying to do is just observe reality as it is. And when you are observing reality as it is, what happens is that um, 
reality begins to like unfold the way that it's bound together it starts unfolding and um and then eventually you come across the truth like that you know whether you want to call it like the unconditioned or the ultimate truth or nibbana um and it takes a lot of time you know like it could be lifetimes to get there but um what you do know is that you're taking steps forward on the path if your equanimity is growing and um if you're less reactive than before so that's kind of like what I hold myself to is like, if I'm a little less reactive than before, then I'm moving in the right direction. Yeah. But it's all about observe, like just observe do, and, and your mind will refuse to do that. It will do its best to just like get in there and, you know, assess this and evaluate that and judge that. And it's like, no, no, that's, you know, just come back, relax. Let's just observe what's happening. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're ready for an audience question. Okay, this one from Robert Schultz. Um, hi, Diego. Could you share one key personal takeaway from writing and your latest book? Um, uh, one key personal takeaway for me is like learning how I write, like how I write specifically. And um, I've been learning a lot that for me, um, writing just comes in waves. Um, and it's not you know, I, I, if I try to force myself to write every single day and write like five pages or whatnot, it just doesn't work. Like a lot of it's just not good. Um, but in those moments when I can literally feel that energy of creativity, I make sure to strike. Like I make sure to just like pull out my phone, pull out my laptop, whatever it is, and just, you know, write whatever is coming up. Um, and to just be okay with that like ebb and flow of creativity because a lot of times when I first started writing, it would just stress me out. And I was like, oh man, I haven't written anything new in like three weeks. Like, what am I going to do? But it's fine. As long as you just like stay open to that and to stay open to the creativity and, you know, having like having my aspiration to like to be a writer, um, it eventually comes together. And um, yeah, I've, I've been grateful that uh, that I've learned to just like to not fight that flow. Yeah. Mm. I will put in a plug for the audio book, which you read yourself. Um, so you get to experience not only the words, um, but you get to hear them presented by the author. Uh, and it's a really fantastic experience. I really enjoyed that. All right, Thank another you. question. Okay, this from Ali Manshine. Would like to know your thoughts on setting boundaries with people who are healing, how to support them, but from a distance when they have not made enough progress to not be hurtful or triggering. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point. I, I feel like when we are engaging with our own world and we're trying to, you know, just embrace our transformation, there often comes, you know, it's often a type of situation where you kind of have to allow yourself to cocoon and to just like build these qualities and then kind of reemerge. Um, and that doesn't mean like totally shying from the world, but there, you know, you can take like a, a month to two month period to like go out a little less to just like take more time to focus on yourself. And I think it's the same with other people. I think, you know, just because someone has done something bad, it doesn't mean that they're going to do that same bad thing forever and ever, but it may take them time to develop those qualities to not fall into that same habitual pattern over and over again. So if you find that um, the person you know, at some point they may be ready to, you know, you may be ready and they may be ready to re-engage. Um, I think just, just be mindful because you don't, you don't want to ever put yourself in a situation where you're just like, um, you know, getting stepped on by another person or being hurt by them. And, and, um, and there's no relationship that ever exists without hurt, but at least when it's, you know, if they can't control themselves and you need to like, be careful with yourself. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Great. Uh, another question, please. Okay. Rose Bloom asks, can you share more about your connection with Wisdom Ventures? We shared a little bit, but uh, yeah. what else would you like to share? Um, yeah. So I think, uh, so our friend Soren, right? Our mutual friend Soren Gordhammer, he's like, he's just such a cool guy. Like he's always imagining and like, and trying to think about like how can people be better connected and what can we do to give to the world and he's the one who him and his um partner cecily came up with wisdom ventures together but he slowly started like gathering his like 
sort of compassionate X-Men, I would imagine, you know, and he, you know, reaches out to Jack Cornfield and he's like, well, you know, do you want to be a part of it? And he says yes. And um, one in time, Soren and I are talking about it and I'm like, um, you know, Soren, I'm like, I want to be a part of this too. I want to jump in on this. And then we're like, okay, we need someone who has like extraordinary, like uh, investment experience. So we're like, oh, we need Bradley. <laughs> we like pull Bradley in. But um, I think Wisdom Ventures, like we're all general partners, we're all co-founders. And I think we just are like really excited about trying to just make the world a more compassionate place. So literally scale up compassion and also transform what venture capital looks like, like as we're going through this process. And um, it's been really beautiful just um, finding these companies that we're supporting already and funding and um, opening ourselves up to more funding and to just growing Wisdom Ventures because we really want to, um, we all signed up for this because we want to make a big impact. Yeah, I love what you said about the X-Men. Every one of us involved has a, a superpower and, yeah. and because we're a seed fund, the investments are small, but um, who wouldn't want access to Jack Cornfield exactly. to help yeah. <laughs> your company be a more mindful company and to get your strategies and agendas and products doing good for people, you know, and that's, that's what we really offer is sort of this community of like-minded folks that can help bring into alignment uh, tech and products and capitalism with the things that we believe healing and the ability to make this world a better place for all of us. So it's it's been a joy and I encourage any of you that are interested to come on and, and help us with that. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. From Sunaya, Sunaina Ranga Rajan. Sorry, Sunaina, I, I didn't do justice to your name. Uh, your question or comment is, uh, love your writing and books. What is one quote or phrase that always inspires you? Um, the, well, there's there's two. There's one there's one that I wrote that I really like a lot, and then there's um, like a bunch of quotes from Jiddu Krishnamurti that always stick with me. Um, so one that I wrote that I, that really just inspires me and reminds me of like the crux um, of what I'm talking about is that. Um, it goes, love is not, um, I will give this to you if you do this for me. Love is, I will give this to you so that you may shine. And um, highlighting that selfless quality of love um, in the midst of this like time period where, you know, everyone's talking about, a lot about boundaries. Everyone's talking about how to love themselves. I wanted to also highlight the importance of like, you know, whether it's a friendship or an intimate relationship a lot of love is built on this selflessness. And if you are able to bring two people who are open to growth, people who are developing their emotional maturity, and they're both willing to, to give to each other, and then both of you will receive so much. Um, and I think that's like a really important thing to remember. Um, and a quote from Jiddu Krishnamurti that inspires me so much and is always making me think is, um, he said the inner... Uh, creates the outer, but the outer molds the inner. Um, so I'll say it one more time. The inner creates the outer, and the outer molds the inner. So um, I thought it was just so beautiful because oftentimes we just think about one or the other, but we really have to understand, like, we're definitely creating this, everything that's happening around us, but all of our life, all that we encounter, it's conditioning us simultaneously. So being aware of that is, is really helpful. Yeah. Mm, thank you. What a great question. Okay. Next question. This one from Sammy Khan. Hi, Diego. Thank you for sharing your story on healing. How do you deal with negative or somewhat toxic family members? How do you approach hurtful comments from others? Um, it's a really good question. I, I'm fortunate, you know, like my, my immediate family, um, there's a lot of harmony between us. And um, I think the way I approach hurtful comments from others is I, I do my best to send them a lot of love. Um, you know, the practice of metta is like something that, um, that I, you know, I practice daily and I'm trying to like share my merits, my peace with all beings. Um, 
And if someone's saying something hurtful, like, then clearly they're coming from a place of like massive tension and turbulence. Um, so, you know, it's really important to realize that you, you don't need to like accept someone's turbulence, even if they're offering it. They're like, here, join me with my anger, like join me, but you don't have to say yes. So when I see negativity, I do my best to send love its way. I love the story in your book of how um, your own relationship with your father deepened mm -hmm. and it sounded sort of like coaxing a squirrel over. You sort of uh, <laughs> found physical affection as a, a means of um, really connecting and expressing mm -hmm. that, that love that you knew was there and, and expressed in many other ways, but it was a more direct and accessible manifestation of that that you sort of introduced um, and really, really enjoyed hearing that. But uh, yeah, I think we're all on a journey, a healing journey with respect to family. It's one of the, you know, uh, paths we all have and we all share that. And it's, it's really, um, something you deal with very beautifully in the book. Yeah. And, and, you know, go, just going back to the question too, it's making me think like if there is a case where you have a family member that is causing you in particular, a lot of harm, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating a safe space for yourself. So it's, um, like everything is situational, everything is case by case and um, understanding like your own dynamic and what you need to thrive. Um, it's really important understanding it and then applying it. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question. And this is from Grace Drew Shabin. And she says, something I'm dealing with is so much shame around my past. And lately, I feel that I'm making similar mistakes over and over again. Mm -hmm. Any words of advice? I've also dealt with addiction. Yes. Um, I think the fact that you are even aware that um, you are like slightly moving in a direction that you don't want to move into, I think that's a massive, massive sign of progress. So you have to like laud yourself for that. And, and um you know, like clap for yourself for the fact that you even have enough self-awareness to see that, oh, I'm making some choices again that are reverting back into my past. Like that's actually a victory. Like you actually can see yourself better than before. Um, and because you can already see yourself that well, that means it'll be, um, you have just a lot more ammunition to like continue trudging forward. You have the fuel you need to like really um, sort of double down on the habits that, um, that you actually want to build. And I think it's, um, it's going to be back and forth. And sometimes like you'll, you'll like, you know, take three steps back instead of one and think it's, it's, it's a long journey, but if you keep trying, which is like literally everything. And I like what you said earlier, Bradley, about repetition, because I have a line too, where I write like a lot of healing is repetition. Like you just, you're just trying to repeat the good habit over and over again. And it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to be pretty, but it's really about being open to trying again. And um, at some point it'll stick and, um, but you have to be patient with yourself and you have to just keep that energy at it. Well, unfortunately that's all we have time for. I want to thank all of you that joined us today and mostly thank you, D Diego. Thank you for the work you do on yourself, the courage it takes to pursue the path you've chosen and also the generosity of, documenting it, sharing it, writing it, and uh, putting yourself out there uh, for all of us to learn and grow and heal. So thanks so much for, for spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Everybody who was listening, and especially Bradley, thank you so much for yeah having me and um, helping me with this talk. And yeah, so grateful for our friendship. And um, yeah, thank you all. Sending all of me you too. love. You speak beautifully about friendship in the book, and it, it really made me value our friendship. So thank you uh, for, for that in particular. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Ciao.